Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Saturday Morning Mastermind. I'm going to play host today um, for our uh, current subject. Uh, we're in the book uh, In Art and Gabriel, and we're in the chapter called Revelation. Um, sorry, we've been away, I think, for a couple weeks because of uh, things going on in our lives, and, and uh, I was missing the last time because of a, a personal issue going on in my life. My brother passed away. So with that, but, um, my name is Dan Sissick. I'm here in uh, beautiful Las Vegas, um, where we keep having the ups and downs of the weather, trying to heat up and cool off and heat up and cool off. So I will be glad when it makes this decision and just heats up because I like the summer and the heat. Um, and I'm joined here with Samantha. Uh, Sandy and Karen, and we haven't seen Sandy's beautiful and wonderful face for a while, so we're so happy to see her and have her join us, and hopefully she'll uh, have some stuff to add or chime in with. Um, and, and so as we get into uh, uh, Revelation, so you know that we have been talking about uh, the conversation that Leonardo da Vinci has been having with um, Gabriel the uh, um, archangel and the, um, one of the main angels um, in the Bible that uh, is used by God. But, excuse me, sorry, but in this book, it's more of, it seems like Gabriel's more um, acting of his own intentions and trying to help Leonardo out with his uh, rendering of the Last Supper, and he's kind of stuck, and I just kind of recap. Uh, go back over he's kind of stuck on how he wants to draw the face of god in or jesus in this case in the painting as well as uh, uh judas the betrayer and but he wants to do them in a way that uh portrays them so that i think everybody will see a sense of their own rendering what they might believe jesus or god or and judas might have been in, but also put it in a way of where there's a true rendering of who they are, what their character is, not just his own picture and own imagination. And then, as we read in the last chapter, he kind of uh, uh, drew Judas as his own, you know, with the face of his own personal, <laughs> uh, you know, of Judas, as he called it, which kind of, you know, to me is um, a little. Twitter that he's trying to be so true to, to, you know, to the aesthetic of what he's trying to get to, and then he uses his phone. So to me, but I think we all tend to do that sometimes. I think we tend to, you know, as we're trying to look at, and look at it for what it's about, you know, and, you know, that true idea, and identity, we all tend to throw our own judices in there so that way we can better comprehend it and better um, wrap our heads around it. But from there, um, he does that, and then he still continues on because he still has the rendering of Christ and or the face of God, you know, here on Earth. And so with that, that's how he continues on. And, and so now in Revelation, he gets uh, he has to uh, start realizing that uh, he's going to be avoiding. The Monks of the and patrons of Santa Maria del Grazi, and until he's prepared to paint Jesus, that way he would, would not have to deal with all, everybody saying everything about what, how he painted Judas and stuff like that. And from there, I'm gonna throw it out and open to um, as I have not fully read all of the chapter, uh, so I'm gonna be honest. So I will be trying to catch up a little bit more as whoever has any thoughts or ideas I can throw what they got out of the chapter. So I'm going to move that, mute out for a minute and go from there. I will let everybody introduce themselves. Sorry about that, you guys. It's okay. It's been a while since I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Samantha Studebaker Carl. I'm coming at you from a beautiful Hilton Head Island today. And um, here's my grandson, Owen. Come here, buddy. Oh, he wanted to read us a book. So 
He's got his book right here. <laughs> but, oh, I'm kind of distracted, so I apologize if I'm not following the train of thought today. Good morning, Sandy. Ruth here in sunny Miami Beach. It's a little chilly this morning in the 50s. Same thing here. We're having fluctuations where it was like 83 last week, and then it tipped into the 50s. And I think this is the last bump of cool weather, and then it's going to get super hot. Um, but yeah, I haven't been on here in a while, so I wanted to see your faces. I have to get ready for work, so I'm going to be listening in the background. If I hear something that I want to talk about, I'll pop in. But I'm sort of have to rush and get ready. But happy to see you and be here and listen in on the new book. Are you frozen again, Karen? Does she look frozen to you, Dan? Maybe it, to me it kind of looks like she's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's frozen. I think she's having internet issues. Today. I think she's frozen too. So um, I will kind of see what I can. You know. Um, so basically, on this, you know, he did. Uh, avoid them and he rode to the Blackbird Tavern and spent the day walking in the woods while uh, contemplating the revelations and his good friend Niccolo's observations about what he painted and what he decided to come up with. And then he saying he Da Vinci found it hard to wrap his head around the fact that he had a meeting pending with the Almighty. Might it actually happen? What would it be like? And I think we've all, that to me is something I've thought about a lot. And um, it's interesting a lot of times, and I'm going to throw this out because there's a song that is absolutely my ultimate favorite song. I have two, um, but this is my ultimate. It's called I Can Only Imagine. It's by a group called Mercy Me. And as you, and you may not understand the, but it's, uh, the song is about, you know, what I believe is, you know, when I get to heaven, how it will be when I see God and I'm there in his presence and everything and how majestic, but how will I react? How will I, you know, respond? Will I just be there and just like standing in pure awe? Will I fall to my knees? Will I sing praises, you know, because I'm just so filled with, you know, being in that glory and stuff. Um, and um, I'm going to go back to what I've read in the Bible and things like that, not necessarily mean that, you know, it's actually gospel or true. I believe it is. But there was a time when um, uh, Moses actually was allowed to see the backside of God because it says that in our mortal state, you know, if we were to see the face of God, we would die. So in that sense, you know, that glory, that awesomeness, that pure and probably Sandy would probably agree with me, probably a pure sense of energy and light and uh, pure emotion, I think, in the raw sense of, you know, how it would resonate with us. You know, it, it just, you know, to be in that presence, how would I, how would I really, you know, prepare for that or how would I respond? And I think that's a fair uh, thing that, you know, Da Vinci is assuming, you know, how, you know, and again, you know, the answers were maddeningly impossible to predict. Uh, I can, you know, and so, but he didn't want to beat himself. He wandered in the war, uh, woods and just trying to, I think, connect. Like for me, sometimes uh, just going and finding that solitude and that place and that time, whether it be in my room sometimes, just me and listening to music, me and music tend to, that's where I tend to find my solitude and my place of where I can really just tune in and uh, I think in a lot of ways feel that presence of um, God, infinite intelligence, the universe, you know, whatever. So, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, not sure, you know, that's my thoughts. So, what do you guys think, uh, Karen or Sandy, or Karen, Sandy, or Samantha? Um, 
I think the, the revelation at the end of this chapter was really, um, I don't know, surprising, if you will. Um, but in the kind of in the beginning, when when uh, Leonardo gets back with Gabriel, they kind of re um, what's the word I'm looking for? They kind of review what they've come to a conclusion of so far, and um, so maybe we, we kind of reiterate a little bit of that. Um, he says, uh, Gabriel says, "You and I have come a long way, Leonardo. I'm confident that tonight our journey will reach its glorious conclusion. Let us begin by reflecting on prior learnings." And he said, we began by picturing a horse rather than a flowing robe. We ended it by determining that the asexual it is a more proper pronoun for God than the conventional he. And then he said, uh, during our intervening discussion, we agreed on the triple trinity of qual qualities that define God and only God. And then those nine descriptions are a premise and they are chiseled in stone. And so he said, uh, we identified God as omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. And it is the unmoved mover who created the universe and judges our action. It is benevolent, eternal, and worthy of worship. And then um, Leonardo, he, you know, he was like, the pronoun pesters like a pebble in the shoe. And I think he's research, he's referring to the pronoun it versus calling God a he and um, and so that's kind of something that they're kind of, he's, he's struggling with a little bit and then um, let's see he says uh, he asked Gabriel asked Leonardo if he's confident with the list of uh, descriptions and the only other one that he was thinking of was infallible and yet um, he says, humans aren't poised to judge matters from God's perspective, so how can we say what is or is not a mistake? To my eye, the world is full of apparent imperfections. In fact, I might argue that it has no perfections. And then Gabriel is like, perfection is a matter of perspective. And um, they talk about perfection a little bit, and he says, but variety, um, let's see, perfection it can only be achieved through variety, so it is with most things, but variety requires variance, which is by definition imperfection. Um, and then he says only as, only when you consider God's creation as a whole can you understand the grand perfection. And so then they kind of put infallibility, infallibility alongside of benevolence as it just, you know, it depends on your perspective, and so it's not really a, a, a point that was absolutely necessary to come to conclusion on with all of these description of, of you know to solving for God as what he is what they were they were kind of coming to to uh, determine because they're they're talking about you know kind of setting aside all of our human desire our our human um, what's the word I'm looking for our um, uh, kind of human programming or the things that we've been taught our um, uh, what's that word? <laughs> but anyway, the, he's basically oh, preconceived notions. He's like talking about setting aside our preconceived notions and what we think God is, and solving for God based on these definitions that we kind of come to in this in this uh, in the book along at this point. And and we've discussed a, you know all of them to pretty good extent. And and although I don't rem exactly agree with every aspect that they have. Um, they have come to I get the, the basic idea of you know let's try and like put aside all of our ideas of what we think you know and let's try and figure it out like a math problem if you will and um, and so that's what they're trying to do yes yes okay what are you doing okay um, so let's see here okay so Leonardo he's you know he's confident that he can embrace whatever the conclusion is uh, but he's concerned because Gabriel is like you know it's gonna surprise you what we're about ready to say and it may not strike you as as obvious as you think it's going to and of course Leonardo's like well yeah I guess if it was obvious then somebody would have figured it out by now and um, <clears throat> And then, but then he also tells Leonardo, he was like, you're familiar with this. You, you've known it all along. And it, yeah, even though it's going to surprise you, it's, you know, it's something you're very familiar with. <clears throat> I'll let you 
guys want to discuss that for a minute and um, let me make sure everybody's okay. And we'll come back to the revelation. At the end. Yeah, I, I like part of what you were saying there, Samantha, because I think the key thing is we're all, I think we're all familiar with it in a sense. And however we define, you know, God, infinite intelligence, the universe, however, you know, people, and I think we are all a little bit familiar with it, but at the same point, going back to what you were saying about you know we do use our preconceived notions and thoughts about it rather than trying to go at it from a more abstract point of view or more um, general point of view and i think you know gabriel's right i think that when we really open ourselves up to looking at it that we are going to be astonished that everything that we have that's familiar about it will be there but everything that we have not opened ourselves to contemplating or thinking of what could be <laughs> added in are going to be there too and that i think that's where we're going to be put off because we don't like things that are not necessarily within our wheelhouse or within how we look at things or establish things to fit us in our lives. And I think that's the one area that everybody does not want to admit and take into, you know, take into account. I don't know. What do you think, Karen? Have we discussed what that is? Have we revealed what that is? Um, I, it seems to me that we need to do that and probably in a way that's uh, like, it, it seems like in the book, it's just kind of laid out there. It's just, Gabriel just kind of drops it. Is that right? And I, honestly, uh, I was going to say, I honestly don't know because I'm not fully finished reading the chapter. So I think, Samantha, and you probably have more of that answer than even I. I'm just trying to go out based on what Samantha was just saying. Well, as I was mentioning earlier, I'm not smart enough to talk about this part of things. Uh, and I say that because uh, I think that there's a lot of people who uh, who don't feel comfortable speaking about this. Uh, Sam, what we were saying while you were away was uh, we haven't we haven't said what what it is, uh, what the big reveal is, and it seems to me in the book it's just kind of dropped there. Is that what you, what you recall? Yeah, they kind of um, reiterate, you know, what we've learned so far, what the, the conclude or the um, the list that they've come up with to define for God, or to um, what's the word? That, uh, either way, um, to figure out what God is, and um, and then at the end, Gabriel is just like blah. So, do we want to reveal that right now? Discuss that. Okay. So he says at the end, you know, after we talked about these defining qualities, and then he says, um, God hides in plain sight, camouflage like a king in amongst garb. It does this by wearing another name. You know God as time. And um, so that time being God, and I, I mean, I, I guess it, maybe in the next chapters he's going to go through and say, you know, time is everywhere, time, time is omniscient, time is et cetera, et cetera, all the, the different things. And, um, but my first reaction to that is, is the fact that time doesn't exist. It's, it's all in our head. And, um, 
And so then that makes me go, hmm, okay, that's that's an interesting concept to say that that time is God or God is time. Because, I mean, I, I guess if you look at time in a lot of different ways, you know, yeah, it's supposedly everywhere. I mean, it's in everyone's minds. It, it's, it, it, you know, I could be considered like a judge as time is kind of the thing that, that um, you know, judges all our actions, I guess. Yeah, I don't, but at the same time, I'm like, but my first, again, reaction is time doesn't exist. It's yeah. it's just in our mind. And, and, you know, and I looked up a couple of things on the definition of, of time, you know, from a scientific perspective. And time is basically, it, it just boils down to it only exists because we have memories. We have the capability of having memories if we did not have memories we would have absolutely no concept of time because there would be no past there would be no future it would just be the here and the now and um you know and i think for everything other than humans and some types of animals that is what it's like there is no you know I don't know for sure that plants don't have a memory, but if they don't and they're just simply living in the now, then for them, God, if God was to be defined as time, God would not exist. And so that's a big, huge thing for me. It's, it's like, hmm, then it makes me think, okay, well, then is God completely just a man-made idea altogether just to solve for all these things you don't completely understand? Um, I don't know. So that's my thought. <clears throat> Interesting how that was brought out. And because I'm going to use a weird analogy. And we were just talking about it before we went live. Like the concept of my brother um, who just passed away almost two weeks ago. Um he had mental issues. I've talked about that before a little bit on prior stuff and things like that. But yet, if you were to ask him, I really believe that if you were to ask him what day it is, he cannot tell you. What year is it? Couldn't tell you. What certain events, he couldn't tell you. Yes, he liked to watch TV a little bit, or yes, he liked to listen to the radio. But I think in that concept, he had no real concept of time. He might have memories, but he probably couldn't put it put them into context of any definitive way of like how we do it. You know, you know, I remember back when my nieces and nephews were born. I remember back when I was in high school. Granted, time has uh, blurred some of those things and I don't remember every little detail. With some things I remember every little detail because of the impact it had on my life. But I also look at time because you brought up an interesting point because and what I've been brought up with, what I've read, what I believe and stuff, you know, that God has existed in eternity, but how long is eternity? You know, you know, do we really understand that vacuum of what that contains and what that's about? <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and if essence, if God is really more... Um, a power or energy, which I believe in a sense he has all those attributes as well as a lot of many other things too, um, then, you know, that could help with the idea of that time and that, you know, of that, you know, there's more to it than we give, but because of how our brains are formed and how we were put together and wired and everything and how the intelligence, the universe, God, how we're designed this, that's how, in order to help us be able to understand and constitute it and put something there that we're still trying to grasp and understand that is beyond our grasp and measure. And I think, you know, Leonardo and Gabriel may be right. We, <clears throat> along with the human aspects and the human emotions that go with it, but you still have to kind of extract that out a little bit and go back to the logical and look at it, you know, 
as much as you can from that while employing and while putting the humanistic part of it in there to bring it to full, I think, fruition. But you can't narrow the the human aspect of it to your preconceived stuff. You have to broaden broadening out into a more generalized and far, <clears throat> expanded, far-reaching aspect of that. And I'm not, I'm honest, I never looked at it from that perspective. Yeah, I was just thinking about what time is, and I'm sorry if I wasn't completely following what you were saying, Dan, because it, I got distracted by my own thoughts, and I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> I got the kids in the background, everything else, you know, but I. Uh, the other thing, because I was, you know, as soon as it, it says time, then the first thing that I want to do is I want I want to pull up information on what is time, you know, and um, and of course, uh, you know, there's there's Einstein's theory of re relatively relativity that has to do with with time also, and that time is relative depending on where you are, and uh, one of the things that I was reading on uh, a physics website was they were talking about. Um, time how time is different for um like the folks that are on the space station time moves slower for them than it does here it's like if we're down here on the world and we synchronize our watches and we go through our days our watches will stay the same but if somebody up in the up in the space station synchronizes their watch with you down here on the earth then after a few days their their clock is slower than ours because they're going faster i, I don't know why but for whatever reason, it has to do with this. Um, it's, it's like, I guess, uh, because they're going like 14,000 miles an hour going around the, the, the earth. And I have not ever been able to really wrap my head around why that, that works that way. But there's, it has to do with the, the, um, the speed of light. And because of the fact that time is a measurement versus a, a fixed thing it's not it's not even a thing it's a concept and um and, it's, and then you know like dan when you were talking about how do we know how old you know how how long in infinity is or, or um what was the word you were using uh, eternity um we can't really know because all that we can know is what we can see in a in the observable universe and the observable part of the universe is only as far as we can see based on how far light has traveled from that far distance and it takes millions of years to get to us and so even though it's gotten to us now when we see this distant distant part of the universe that was millions of years ago when whatever that was happened and so it's 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 just one of those things. It's just like, like so mind boggling. Like they there was um they were talking about uh, one of the articles that I was reading had to do with their their search for habitable planets in the universe. And like the closest planet that falls within the range of habitability around a star that might have the possibility of having life on it is like twenty or thirty light years away. And for us to even have an understanding of what that means, it, it's like so far away that even if they sent something flying at light speed to get there, it, it would still take like 10 years for a probe to get there flying at light speed, which is, is it's just a concept that is, is completely, because light, how fast is light speed? Let me look that up really quick. I'm sorry. I have a about now, a little bit while you're looking it up, is when you were talking about that a little bit, when you were talking about that a little bit, I was like, um, now I kind of, because when you were talking about the space station going around and going faster than us, and there, but the stuff was slowing down, and I it kind of made the analogy that, you know, I've read it in the Bible, and if you've read it, and we, I think we've all heard it maybe in some similar form, you know, a day can be a thousand years, or a thousand years can be a day, you know, in, in God's perspective, 
and when you were saying that that you know the time was going slowing down but they were going fast you know speeding around the earth going faster it kind of made that thought process like, like oh i kind of get that now you know like oh and so in that sense that measurement and that time you know is truly relatively to how you perceive it or where you're at because you know they were going so much faster around the earth than the earth's rotation that you know but yet you know it's almost like they left here but they beat their own time back around kind of if you you know and it goes back into what we all heard in all these you know space you know tv shows and movies as uh, time space continuum or whatever and all that you know it kind of made that kind of a little more understandable to me like oh okay i get that but in essence and then going from here to like you said the you know, or the nearest star, even Alpha Centauri, which is like some four light years away. I think it's four light years away. That's relatively close compared to this one planet that they're talking about. Is but that still would take a you know number of years to get to, and that aspect you know is mind-boggling because going at the speed of light and the speed of light is pretty damn fast. Sorry, you know, yeah. Uh, to even fathom, you know, going like that, but how much does time slow down then? Yeah, and I found out what it does. Do that, and when you're traveling to it. <laughs> yeah, the speed of light is insanely fast. It says that it's 670,616,629 miles an hour is how fast light speed is. And so if an Alpha Centauri is the one that we were talking about, so I don't, maybe it wasn't 10 light years, maybe it's five light years, however, however long it is. And a light year is how far light travels in a year. So if this miles per hour, 670 million miles per hour, and you multiply that by a year, that's like an insane distance. I mean, it's so insane. It's not even something that I feel like we can really conceptualize because of how far, and I think the fastest they can send any kind of a probe at this time is only, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 miles an hour once it gets up to speed. Whatever that one, um, there's a probe that they sent out to, to Pluto, and it's just gone outside the, the, the belt of Pluto recently, and it took like 10 years just to get to Pluto. I mean, so unless they develop some other kind of technology, getting to the first closest star that is within the neighborhood if you will it's within our i think it's within the milky way um i mean so it just goes to show I mean, how enormous the the whole of the universe is is so unfathomable we can't even understand it and when they talk about time as uh i, I think that time is going to be different wherever you are in the universe and just the fact that it's slightly different for just the astronauts that are in the orbit, I, you know, when we have, like, like you were saying, we watch different movies and, you know, and sure there's science fiction, but there is some level of, of basic scientific explanation they're trying to suggest with it when they talk about, you know, things happening when there's like a, a gravitational pull and it changes the speed of light and I don't know, something like that. And then people go and they, you know, supposedly they experience time differently. And, um, <clears throat> but what's interesting for just in that, that aspect of it is like, if time is different compared to where you are and it's only a unit of measure because, you know, it's our way of measuring how long, how far we travel around the sun and that's how we measure our hours and our minutes and our days and our years and et cetera, et cetera. It's a measure. It's, I don't see how it can be when, when you look at, you know, what they're talking about this in this book. I just, you know, I can't see how they can, how, how he can suggest that that's what, what God is. Unless his intention is to suggest that God does not exist, except for in our mind. And, um, <clears throat> maybe that's his thing it's maybe that's what it is it's just in our mind and um because there's all kinds of things in our our perception that is just in our mind <laughs> i mean so who knows i don't know <clears throat> well this uh, 
this book as easy as it is to read and you get, get engrossed in it and you kind of fly through the chapters there's so much packed into it it's so interesting how much you can extrapolate and pull out and you can go off and so and so many different levels and some of them are some real deep levels like this one is like you know it's it's making me think and making me really like go okay so now how to because now once you recognize it and you see it and you you know think about it you can't help but not have to put it back into your equation how you look at things you know or you can choose to ignore it but for me sometimes you know being an accountant and being more a little bit more analytical on things i tend to go okay well if it goes there then you know and like you know um and like we've heard in some of the you know science fiction stuff and things books and stuff you know sometimes and we've seen in movies where sometimes somebody will leave and go somewhere and but yet they either come up younger than when they started or they come up real older than when they started you know way older you know and in that time you know how does that affect and what does that do if you were to go you know like south centauri four light years away or five light years or whatever but it's being the closest star to us in our galaxy um how would that move that many million miles per second how would that if we could truly really travel like that how would that affect us in our state and in our you know in this and how else would that affect us in our perceptions of things and you know how we perceive things you know that's the other thing of it so once again it may be like you said going back to because of how we're created and, and our brains and I'll, I've said this before and other times, you know, we only use about 10% of our true power of our brains if we really, you know, with the exception of a few people, you know, the Einstein's of the world and people like that probably use maybe, you know, 15, 20% or something. But have they really tapped into every aspect of what we have within us capable of being able to do and understand? And is there some sort of mental block or uh, that's not the right word some type of sh short circuit or something that has caused us not to be able to allow or expand or grow into being able to use more of the power of our brain and what we have and what you know is capable so that's another you know aspect you know why does it seem like we can only use this much of our power of our brain when we have so much more capability is it because the design of the universe or infinite whatever didn't feel we could handle all that either except the limited few that use a little bit more of their brain power you know that's the other you know and if we could use some of that would we have a different intelligence time everything would we you know would then that alter our would that even further alter our perceptions of what we're dealing with and i had a thought um when you were just talking about how much of our brain that we use and and um you know i haven't done a whole lot of studying on that i'll probably look that up at some point and be like you know is that still a thought that's that's um that is accurate in the scientific community at this point but a thought that came to me was um you know what if we what if it appears that we don't use that much of our brain but in reality that's like our brain capacity storage you know like storage capacity like on your computer you're using like 10 percent of the memory of your computer and but you have this enormous amount of space left on there I, maybe that's what our brain is for it's not necessarily because we need to like I don't know, do some X-Men type of activities, you know? <laughs> but maybe it's more of this is our brain capacity as, as far as like storage and knowledge and understanding and, and I don't know, that was just a thought that came up to me. Why are you pushing the chair around, man? Just leave it right here. Um, 
there, there's so much that we could talk about on the on that subject, and um, I, it's going to be really interesting because I have not read forward in the book um, just to see where this goes in the in the discussion um, as, as relating to to God as if God is time. So, <coughs> excuse me, oh, we're cr pretty close to the top of the hour. Um, you guys have some final thoughts before we wrap up? No, just to say that um, I wasn't sure what to expect when I, because I hadn't really looked at this chapter, but even the little bits that we've covered and, and without even having fully read it, um, I think I'm going to read it, you know, as I have some time, maybe tonight, um, because I think this chapter is kind of the start of us unlocking a lot of other things and opening up even more as we dive far into this chapter or into this book and kind of push the limits of you know where we think and where we look at and ideas that we haven't thought about that's what I'm getting out of this Thoughts, Karen? Well, <laughs> I'm still stuck trying to find the mic off button. Um, I'm going to try and read up what it was. <laughs> Glad I could entertain you, Dan. Uh, I'm going to try and read what it was about time that I found so uh, flabbergasting. Um, it has a lot to do with with uh, people who find themselves in different time di dimensions, and um, I I just really do have a, a a totally difficult time wrapping my head around stuff like that. Uh, I will tell you that I had a, a fun time with my brother. A uh, week before last, he he's a videographer, and he's um, filming the space shuttle or the the shuttle taking the uh, package to the space station. You know the, the additional food and supplies and all that kind of thing. And he uh, video uh, videographed the uh, putting together of that shuttle around the package, putting the package together and then putting the, the rest of the shuttle the back, back on, on the front on, rolling it out. And he decided to put five cameras around the bottom of the shuttle as it lifted off. The, it, it, the shuttle goes upright uh, next to a water tower and the water shoots down into the bottom. And initially, the lift off is with that, that water with steam. And so he got that, and not even NASA uh, had pictures like that, and it was pretty exciting to uh, have him tell me about that. So um, I I have some closeness to some things that I can understand, <laughs> and I'll try and get a little bit more on board, and then I'll try and remember how to get my mic on and off and, and uh, talk a little bit more next time. I just put a, a link in the, the chat for um, to a, a website I read a lot of uh, scientific articles from. And um, <clears throat> it's really interesting because it, it has information from all different scientific communities. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> some of the discoveries that they, they have made recently and some of the, a lot of the information they've made, you know, they've learned over the years. So it's just an interesting um, website to follow for for that kind of thing. But, um, um, yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around some of this stuff for sure. And um, particularly when he throws out a concept like this. And, um, yeah, so I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see where the book goes from here. Um, so. 
Anyway, it's been a great chat today, guys. Are we ready to wrap up? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, everybody, for everybody who's out there watching this, <clears throat> excuse me, as they're recording, there's some links below this video where you can, uh, you know, connect with us in our Facebook group. Uh, like this video if you found this uh, topic interesting. Uh, share it with anybody you think would find it useful. And um, if you'd like to participate with us, then jump into our Facebook group and just uh, shoot shoot out a message in there and say, hey, I want to participate. And we'd be happy to send you the link because we'd love to hear your perspective on uh, on the things that we're talking about. So with that, guys, have a great, awesome, amazing week. And we'll see you next time on the Saturday morning mastermind. My kids say goodbye.